Hello everyone, Karnasa here, and welcome back to Kerbal Gets Real. We are now in the year 1958, and we have some exciting prospects for this year. That's right, one of the main focuses that we are going to be going for in 1958 will be to send the first human up into space. But once again, we're going to find ourselves in the vehicle assembly building at the start of an episode because I didn't build anything at the end of last episode, which is ro rather silly. If you are playing RP1, I would highly advise not to do this. The only reason why I didn't have anything in my build queue is because that would have meant an extra vehicle assembly building section, which usually takes quite a long time. And I didn't want that episode to really kind of run on. But anyway, this thing that we're going to be building here, it's going to attempt to complete the first communication satellite contract. And of course, I have inventively named this COM1 because I couldn't really think of anything else if I'm going to be particularly honest. But it's gone through all of the relevant testing in Crash and everything worked fine as long as I put those solar panels on because yes, that was one of the requirements of the contract and I forgot that in my first test. So it's lucky that I do those tests really because Otherwise, we would have got that up and it would have failed. However, this is the main reason why we're going to be in the vehicle assembly building at the start of this episode. This thing is going to be Artemis OX-1, which is going to stand for Artemis Orbital Explorer 1. You may remember last episode, we sent three Artemis probes to the moon, all three of them impacted, and it was a rather successful mission. Now what we want to do, well, we want to orbit the moon because that's going to give us a lot more money and it's also going to give us a lot more science and we want to unlock all of the science that we can as quickly as possible really because we have a Venus transfer window coming up in 513 days. I guess we've got that Mars transfer window up as well, but I don't think we're going to be able to perform that in that time frame. But no, that Venus transfer window is looking rather promising and that will be really exciting. And well, to get that transfer window, to be able to build a craft that's capable of going to Venus, we're gonna need to unlock better communications technology because right now we can chat about as far away as the moon and obviously Venus being, well, a lot further than the moon, we're going to need better technology. But enough about that future mission. Let's talk about this Artemis OX-1. So that top stage is going to be powered by hydrazine. That is a tank full to the brim of hydrazine and we're going to be using that for our actual circularization for our capture at the moon. It's got about 950 meters per second delta V in it. So that's more than enough. You only really need 800 to get kind of a circular orbit. However, that thing needs a little bit more because the AJ-10 stage that we have here is not quite enough to get us to the moon. No, that has around 2,900 meters per second of delta V and obviously you need about 3,150. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna completely burn that stage and then we're gonna use a little bit of that final stage to kind of get that last little bit of delta V that we need to really reach the moon. Now. Having two AJ-10 series engines on one stage is rather risky because as I've said before in this series, those things, well, they have a very high ignition failure rate, but having upgraded them to the AJ-10-101A series, they are slightly better. But here we are in the Space Center and we got a lot of money from picking up that Lunar Orbiter contract. So what are we gonna do? We're gonna do what we always do and that is we're gonna put all of those points straight back into the vehicle assembly building and R&D. I don't spend all of them on that because obviously I have to unlock new items and new basically pieces of equipment for my rockets. So yeah, but a lot of it does go on, but I do like to have a little bit of a buffer just so I can unlock new things. Here we have the Communications 1 satellite on a Hercules small launch vehicle on the 4th of February, 1958. Now, we were due a failure. And of course, that's exactly what happened here. We had thrust loss on that LR-105 core stage. And because this happened right at the start of the launch, well, <laughs> yeah, we are not going to be getting this thing to orbit today, which is a real shame. But like I said, it's probably about time we were due something like this. But oh well, things happen. Test light is a... Well, it's a thing in RP1, it's a thing that you've got to deal with. And to be honest, that wasn't the worst of things that could have happened. It was only a small kind of cheap rocket, so not too bad. 
But here we have one of the better rockets that we are going to be launching, an Artemis OX-1 on the 15th of April, 1958. And of course, this is going to be launched on a Hercules, Hercules, a Heracles 2 launch vehicle. I keep mixing those up because obviously they were called Hercules originally, and then I renamed them to Heracles being the Greek equivalent of the Roman, Roman hero, demigod, whatever, whatever you want to call him. But yeah, this thing worked rather well. Obviously, I skipped out most of that ascent because we have seen this so many times now, there is real, really no reason to show that thing over and over and over again. But there we have our course for the moon plotted. We are going to settle ourselves down and ignite that AJ-10 stage. And would you believe it, they both fired successfully and they fired successfully all the way through. We haven't particularly had a failure on one of those stages, which is really surprising because yeah, they are, well, quite well renowned for failing. But Obviously, you can see me there now using that hydrazine thruster to get the last little bit of this burn because that AJ-10 stage was not quite enough. However, this thing is more than capable of getting us to the moon. And a great thing about this is because it's such low thrust, you can really fine tune your approach. So here you see, yep, I've got my moon periaps, but I'm going to get it a little bit closer because, well, we might as well get it as close as possible. And then yeah, at around, I think I go for about 40,000 meters in the end, and then we can just drag on that retrograde vector and get ourselves a nice capture. And you can see it only takes 670 meters per second, so we have more than enough delta V in that stage, even after using some of that stage to burn to the moon. But here we are, we have reached the moon and we're gonna fire up that hydrazine engine once again. And one thing about this is it does have multiple ignitions. It has unlimited ignitions, which is really, really nice. However, as I have mentioned previously, it is an incredibly low thrust engine. So the burn time to do just 670 meters per second of Delta V did take around six minutes. So it's got its uses, definitely, but you don't want to be doing like particularly, well, quick burns with this thing. But we didn't need a quick burn. We were able to capture at the moon rather successfully and complete that first lunar orbit. And with the first lunar orbit, of course, we unlock some more science. So what are we going to do? We're going to go into research and development and we're going to pick up that electric node because as I was saying, we are working towards going to Venus. That will be something that happens relatively soon. So yeah, we need to really focus on that area of science. But once again, we're going to be launching the Communications 2 satellite. This is once again on a Heracles small launch vehicle on the 10th of May. 1958 and that thing went off without a hitch we had our ascent it was all wonderful everything was brilliant nothing broke which is always really nice and then yeah we got this little cubic satellite up into space and we have plotted ourselves a maneuver to bring up the apple apps to over four and a half thousand kilometers as required by the contract now <laughs> I don't know if you saw there, but this is using a very, very, very small RCS thruster. So that burn took around 12 minutes to do. So yeah, be thankful this is at four times speed. Back at the Space Center and we are just going to time warp a little bit ahead because we've got some exciting developments that are going to be coming up shortly. And of course, one of them being the technology for basic capsules, which we are definitely going to be using straight away. And here we are in the vehicle assembly building doing, well, something quite special. We are going to be working on our first crewed, crewed rocket really. And this will actually be the first crewed kind of flight ever in this space agency. I have mentioned I didn't do X-planes or anything like that. So yeah, this will be the first time that we have crew on. And of course we've got that launch escape system because we want to ensure maximum safety. We want to make sure that if any engine goes wrong or anything like that, we can get our crew member who is going to be sat in that capsule out as soon as possible. Now I've added a couple of batteries to this stage just so we can get this thing. This thing can last in space just longer than a day so we can pick up the record record of being in space for a day as well. It's got enough food, water and oxygen in there to last about a day and a half. 
So yeah, the only thing really that the limiting factor in that capsule is the electricity. I didn't want to add solar panels all over it. I just wanted to basically make it last a little bit longer because I do think having solar panels all over that capsule will look rather silly. So yeah, let's just go with the batteries. But now I'm going to be working on the interstage that is going to basically connect that capsule to the actual Heracles 2 rocket that we will be launching this thing on. And then what we got to do is we got to figure out a way of actually getting this thing back down to Earth once we have got it into orbit because we can't just leave our astronauts up in space. That would be rather terrible of us. So we're going to put six retro rockets in underneath that launch escape system and that should do us the trick. Going to do a little bit of a black and white paint scheme like I've said before. That seems to be the way that my paint schemes seem to be going at the moment. And of course we are going to attach a Heracles 2 rocket to it because this thing is definitely capable of launching that, that crude mission to space. So we really have made a lot of use out of this one vehicle and I would highly recommend trying to do that in an RP1 career because well you save out on tooling costs and all of that and it just makes it yeah you can really save a lot of money by doing that and there we go I slightly adjusted those retro rockets to only include two because when in testing this thing in crash yeah that with those six was pulling around eight and a half g's and was way 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 too much so yeah we only really needed two We have been getting a little bit of background science from our Artemis OX Explorer. So what I've gone and done is I've gone and unlocked another communications node. Obviously we need to be really focusing on that communication so that we can communicate as far as Venus, which is where we really want to be able to communicate to because that is the next big goal that we are going to be going for after crewed spaceflight. And here we have the launch of the Artemis OX2 and yeah. <laughs> so that happened. Basically what I was trying to do was I was trying to get a pretty cinematic shot of that thing launching and an engine failed. And because I was in cinematic view, I was unable to disengage Mechjeb at the time. So yeah, that thing kind of failed drastically. But there's a lot of cleanup to do. And oh, this took so long and it was so tedious and monotonous. But luckily I didn't actually go in and launch any of those because I have done that in the past. And yeah, that's just a long loading screen to get back into flying. Basically a bit of junk. But what I've done there is I've had to create another Artemis rocket because obviously we still have that lunar orbit contract and we do need to fulfill that because that was a big advance. And well, we really can't afford to lose around 350,000 funds, I think is how much we will lose if we fail to do that. But the next main thing that we are going to be really focusing on will be that all important crewed spaceflight. That will be the next rocket on our list. But of course, first, we got a bit more science from those lunar orbiter, well that one lunar orbiter that is currently in orbit around the moon, so I went and finally unlocked interplanetary communications, which is going to be absolutely marvellous once we unlock that for our mission to Venus. And here I tried to launch Odyssey 1, but unfortunately I couldn't because the astronaut was not trained up in time, but a little bit of time warping forward and there we go. And here we are on the launch pad. It is the mission. Odyssey 1 is the name of the mission. Albert Harper is at the wheel and he is hopefully going to be the first person that achieves orbit on the 25th of September 1958. Now, yep, it's on a Heracles 2, so we have seen these being launched repeatedly. This thing really, really, really has made its, well, it's made its money back when we taught this thing. I didn't realise we'd be using it quite as much as we are. But here we have some lovely little shots of inside the capsule. This will be what Albert Harper is seeing as he makes his long and quite frankly dangerous ascent up to orbit. But you know what? It all worked perfectly. Well, it has worked perfectly up until now. The core stage was fine and then we had that upper stage which worked fine and then we were able to detach that capsule. And I launched this into a polar inclination because the crew science that you can get on a capsule is biome specific and it gets you a lot of science. I think it gets you about five science points per biome that you visit and it doesn't take a particularly long time to actually do that science. So this thing was incredibly successful. Odyssey 1, named so after the Odyssey, named after Odysseus and all of, all of that, was incredibly, incredibly successful. This has probably been the best mission I've done so far in terms of money and science. It gained us almost 100 science. It gained us well over a million funds because we broke all kinds of records. We did the Kármán line contract. We did the break the speed of sound contract. We got the first crude orbit contract. Yes, 
This thing really changed the shape of our space agency. But yeah, as I was saying, that thing gave us an awful lot of science and an awful lot of money. So what's the thing that we're going to do? Of course, we're going to go into research development and spend all of that science as soon as possible. And what I've done is gone in and unlocked all of the avionics, more solar power, more science, because of course, we're going to need to get more scientific equipment to unlock more science. Science buys you science, basically. A little bit of a cleanup. And then, yeah, we did it. We achieved a crude orbit in 1958, that is, well, it beat Gagarin by three years. So I was, I was very, very, very happy with that. And of course, we had 1.2 million funds as well. So what are we going to do? We're going to put them all back into research and development and the vehicle assembly building. I should probably invest maybe upgrading the vehicle assembly building at some point soon. But to be honest, I don't really use it. I kind of, yeah, I prefer just putting all of my points in one because I only ever really build one rocket at a time. I've never really built more than one and I don't like putting my points into another one. It's just the way that I play. I, I don't know if it's a particularly good way of doing it or not, but yeah, it's just how I've done. And I was thinking here about upgrading my launch pad because obviously we will need some bigger launch pads at some point soon. And of course, we had thrust loss on that stage. And because it was a thrust loss, it wasn't an actual engine failure, I had to roll it back. And what I did was I actually upgraded the engines on those things to the next iteration. So here we have the Heracles II launch vehicle, an Artemis OX-3 on the 23rd of November 1958. And this will be the last launch of this episode. As I was saying before, we have upgraded those engines to be the next configuration of engines in the LR89 and LR105 series. We have a LR89 NE5, four of those as the booster stage, and we have two LR105 NE5s as the core stage. But we've basically seen a launch of this already, and yeah, it worked completely well. It That, that AJ10-101A upper stage, once again, worked absolutely fine. The only problem we had was we did have to roll this thing back because of that failed, well, thrust loss on one of the engines. And I think usually what I would do is obviously I would just reactivate the engine. But of course, you can't do that when it is thrust loss. And I think that probably would have meant that we would have failed the mission. That vehicle, the Heracles II, can only just about manage to get one of these Artemis OX probes up into orbit. It is so fine. We have about 50 or so meters per second of delta v left at the end of the core stage of that rocket of the launch vehicle so yes if anything goes wrong then chances are it will not make it into orbit which is a bit of a shame but it to be honest it only took us a few days to roll it back upgrade those engines and then roll it back out to the launch pad and launch it again and would you know we got to the moon and we got another successful orbit once again using that very slow hydrazine thruster to do the circularization burn well, the capture burn when we actually reached the moon. But we're going to pick up another pilot. Karen Richards will be the next person on our roster. And that was the end of 1958. And I'd just like to say a big thank you because I hit 50 subscribers yesterday, I think, as I'm recording this. And yeah, I would like to say a big thank you to everyone that has subscribed to my channel already. And yeah, thank you for all of your comments as well. I do read them all and I do try to reply to them all. But yeah, 1959. Looks like we're going to go for Venus, guys. Probably. We'll have to see that in next episode. If you've enjoyed this episode, why not go give it a like? If you have really enjoyed this episode and would like to continue with the content on my channel, please do consider subscribing as well. I have been Karnasa, and I will see you later. <laughs>